Okay, thank you so much for uh, joining me on the same drugs. Um, I am looking forward to talking with you yet again. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to uh, cover this issue and case for a long time now. Um, it's something that really hasn't been covered too much in the media, at least not from a fair perspective. <laughs> um, but I think maybe, and you've been following it really closely and you have covered it and you're sort of one of the only ones actually. And I, I suppose a good place to start would be around what happened at the beginning in 2015 um, with uh, UBC. So Stephen Galloway, who we're talking about, of course, was the is the was a former head of uh, UBC's, the University of British Columbia's creative writing program, and he was accused of sexual assault by a former student in 2015, and despite never being charged, um, he was suspended and then terminated by the university. Um, <laughs> what happened there? I mean, were you watching this all go down from the get-go? So I had an interesting perspective on this because at the time the Stephen Galloway meltdown occurred, I was at my previous job, which is actually how I met you. So this was at the Walrus uh, where I, I, I briefly worked, I think, 2015, 2016, which also coincided with the period during which the Galloway saga unfolded. And um, I think that it was around the time that you wrote a piece for me um, when I was at the Walrus, uh, completely unrelated, of course. Uh, but what was interesting is when I was at, the, at that magazine, I was surrounded by people who were part of that subculture. Uh, they were... And, and actually, in a few cases, people I work with, I think at least one case, they had actually graduated from the UBC Creative Writing Program. And they knew some of the characters involved. They knew Stephen Galloway, at least in passing. They'd met him. They'd attended his lectures or his courses or whatnot. Um, they were certainly familiar with him as a novelist. And they were also just very familiar with the socially... Uh, and I would say almost psychologically intense <clears throat> atmosphere of these creative writing programs where a few personalities, successful personalities can really dominate the, the atmosphere. And, and Galloway was among other things, a very successful novelist. He'd uh, written this novel called the cellist of Sarajevo, which I think has been translated into like 16 languages, which is <laughs> like 15 languages more than, your uh, your average Canadian novelist, uh, like he was, he's one of the very few Canadian novelists who actually like was successful outside of the minor league government subsidized star system that exists within uh, this the subculture. And he, I think, by his own admission, because I've come to know him a little bit, he let it go to his head. He did some he did some things that a lot of people in some of these small well, actually, UBC creative writing isn't that small, but um, maybe the in crowd there is fairly small, like where the professors will go out for drinks with students, they become overly familiar. Um, you know, there was a particular bar they would go to, I think, actually, it was, I think it was the Legion Hall. Um, it was just sort of this well-known watering hole where they'd go, I think, on Fridays. And everyone was very chummy, and there was this... Um, atmosphere which i mean i think at before the whole meltdown i think people had fun but uh galloway had a wife uh he had an affair this is this is all by his own admission like none of this is, is contested he had an affair with uh, a woman in her early 40s she's the person who subsequently accused galloway of rape of raping her twice uh it was it, i mean it was it was an it was an in many ways, like a very typical academic affair. Um, as, as I said, they were both married. Um, they were both writers. They had this affair. And then I I think he broke it off. Um, and then it things things went went badly. 
I, I'm not going to get into all the he said, she said details because it's uh, it's extremely complex and all, all you have to do is get one detail right and you're, you're one detail wrong and you're in trouble for defamation wise. I'll just say that um, she, she made a, a lot of very far-fetched accusations that were subsequent, subsequently investigated by a former Supreme Court um, justice bc supreme court justice her, her last name is boyd forget her first name um but it was, it was very strange so she investigated she found i think she found the grounds for some sexual harassment on a balance of probabilities she didn't find that any rape had occurred but it was the whole thing was very strange because the accuser and, and i'm saying the accuser because i think the convention is her, her name has actually been mentioned by the cbc and, and other outlets but uh, I think in the current uh, civil proceedings, they're not using her name. She never, my understanding is she never really went to the police. Just, I mean, I think you said in the introduction that, the, that no charges were pressed. It wasn't just that no charges were pressed. I don't think there was any serious effort to actually go to the police and have this investigated. I may be wrong on that, but I, I haven't seen any evidence that this was followed up in the way you would expect an actual sexual assault to be followed up. Yeah, uh -huh. like as far as I'm aware, I, I was reading, you know, Brad, Brad Kranz writing on this, and I'm pretty certain that he said there was never a police right. report filed. Um, now, I, it, it could be like in some future date, like someone produces documentation in this regard. Um, but my understanding is no police, there was no police report. What seemed to be extremely important to the, uh, to the accuser was that Galloway was publicly humiliated, that he was fired. And she was very clever. This is all coming out now as we're talking in the defamation trial. Um, she didn't go to the police. Instead, she went through her academic contacts in, uh, in the department itself. People she knew, uh, people who she knew would be on her side, maybe people who had an ax to grind with Galloway. And, and in one of his posts, uh, Brad Cran, uh, our mutual friend, who, is, who has been attending the proceedings, made a list of all the, the, the various threats and um, <laughs> uh, in, in emotional blackmail, you could call it, uh, in order to pressure people to take her side to, to declare Galloway effectively like persona non gratis, per, persona non grata, uh, basically convict him before any kind of trial. She, I think at one point she said she was going to commit suicide. Uh, she said, you know, you, you have to act before he hurts another woman on campus. And there was a key moment where all of these professors in the, in the creative writing department who were clearly out of their depth, like these are people who, I mean, if you've ever met these poets or novelists or short, I mean, they're dreamers and I mean, they could barely ba balance a checkbook um, or, you know, get through the day without having like a minor nervous breakdown. I mean, it's just, it's a very stereotypical artistic um, art house colony type thing. I mean, this is just characteristic of all artists. There's a certain personality type for better or worse. And sometimes they produce great art and sometimes they produce great drama. And in this case it was drama and they obviously like couldn't handle just the due process aspect of it. And they just, they sort of went all in on this narrative. And by the way, the narrative wasn't crazy. Like if you were there, I mean, he was this guy, he was in a powerful position. Um, you know, maybe like people, in that moment, saw, thought of, of him as like the kind of Gian Gomeshi of UBC creative writing. Uh, mm -hmm. Or, I mean, this is several years later, like, you know, the Harvey, as we would now look at it, like the Harvey Weinstein of, you know, someone who like had a lot of power. And it's not also, that part also isn't crazy. Like in that little subculture, to be a famous novelist, it's not crazy to think like, oh, you know, if you sleep with me, you'll get your novel published. Um, Galloway later wrote an essay saying like, people exaggerated his influence. And, um, but, for these starstruck students, uh, it was completely plausible that he was this like Sven Galli figure who, um, who was like a sexual predator. And there was a whole social panic. And, and the result of the social panic was there was, an, there was an assembly, the school. I mean, this is a university program. It feels weird to call it an assembly. But I think people actually came in. There were hundreds of people who came into the school. And they gave this presentation, which cast Galloway as like this sort of animal predator who's stalking the campus uh you know and if you see him like uh, call, call 911 type stuff and that was it uh because 
like every everybody was drinking the same bathwater in terms of the information they were getting and in terms of the social panic that was being stirred up he was uh guilty without a trial and in that moment it was it was decided and, and this this goes beyond the ubc environment in that moment effectively like the whole canadian literary progressive firmament kind of decided like Galloway is guilty and pronouncing him guilty is going to become a sort of mark of your enlightened status. And, and that's why to this day, I mean, it's been like five or six years, you will still find a small band of diehards. Uh, Alicia Elliott is, is among the most prominent and even journalists like Marsha Lederman at the Globe and Mail, who, who first promoted and peddled these now discredited uh, false accusations against Galloway. Uh, in her journalism, like if you read some of the stuff she's written, like she still seems to be a true believer. I don't know why she's still on the story. I mean, it's she's com obviously completely discredited herself, but um, there are probably like one or two dozen people in Canadian literary circles who still actually believe that Galloway is a rapist. Um, there's well, a few and, other and outside the circles too. I mean, I would say like in Canadian feminist circles, there's probably a lot of people who still believe. Well, sure. And, and, and to be honest, like, I don't, so I'll be honest with you. When I was working at the Walrus, um, I thought Galloway had done all this stuff. I was surrounded by people who I, who, whom I respected and, uh, you know, who I still respect, who, who are part of that culture, maybe on the fringes because they, they had their own concerns about that culture, but they were getting the information from that hothouse and, and they were telling me, yeah, you know, like, it looks like he was a rapist. And I was like, oh, okay. That's, I never met Galloway. In fact, to the old, to the extent, the only way I knew Galloway was like he'd slammed my mother, Barbara Kay, who's who's a very conservative National Post columnist, and and um, my mom had I forget what the details, but he'd written some <laughs> she'd written some column like ma attacking the choice for the Governor General's literary. I mean, as I describe it, it's like, who, who the fuck cares about this bullshit? But it was like some <laughs> little incestuous Canadian literary thing. And she took like the wrong side. And and Galloway, I think in some speech, maybe even, I forget the details, but like took a swipe at my mom. And it, and that was like the only reason I knew his name as this sort of like, I thought of him as like, as, as this ultra woke Canlet guy. And the idea that it would then become like the ultra woke position to regard him as like the Trotsky of Canlit. I mean, that, I mean, it's, it's weird. Um, but yeah, I like, I, like I said, I, it, it wasn't crazy to believe that he had done this stuff. And, and to the extent I'd heard of him or cared about it, I, people around me were saying he was guilty. I commissioned this amazing, it ended up being a really good article. Actually, I'm not even sure I commissioned it. I thought one of my colleagues did it. So the woman's name is Carrie Gold. She's a uh, Vancouver, I think Vancouver based writer. She wrote a really fair piece about Galloway uh, that we published in the Walrus. And I remember reading it and thinking, oh, wow, like this, this woman, Carrie Gold has really done her homework. And she shows that, you know, <laughs> this is not exactly an airtight case. And in fact, if you read the piece, it was like, uh, there's a lot of holes in the story. And, um, and there were, that's kind of maybe one of the clues that the walrus wasn't the place for me because there were people who got mad at us for running this impeccably researched article that Kerry Gould had written. Um, and, and what they wanted basically was either silence from the Canlet establishment or if anybody was going to pipe up about it to say, yeah, he's guilty. And when Margaret Atwood came forward and say, hey, look, we need due process. You know, I, I don't know whether Galloway did the things he's accused of, but we just, you know, we need due process. She was attacked mercilessly um, by, by, now they didn't take her down. She, Margaret Atwood was not canceled. It's, you know, too big a fish. Um, yeah. Much like the effort to take down JK Rowling, I guess. But I, I remember being shocked. Like I, that was sort of when I started to learn about some of the, the toxic and I would say anti-liberal uh, aspects of of this culture, because I mean, due process used to be a left-wing value, right? Um, and it was conservatives who were like, just lock them up and throw away the key. And now I was I, I was surrounded by these literary progressives who were 
who are basically, you know, they were playing the role of the small town Southern sheriff who was like, lock him up, uh, you know, verdict first, trial later type approach to things. So I, that was a real wake up call for me. And um, yeah, and the fact we're still talking about it five or six years later, is, it just shows that <laughs> the case has become this this litmus test among a certain type of hyper dogmatic canadian literary figure that you know if you if you're not willing to say that galloway's a rapist despite all the evidence now showing he isn't uh then somehow like you're a sellout not just to feminism but like everything was hurled at him you know so he, people say oh he's transphobic he's he's racist like it's one of it was one of these mob attacks where like crazy things that had nothing to do with what he'd done you know people said he's anti-indigenous like he's actually i think ethnically part indigenous himself this uh, you know through adoption he he it's not something he ever made a thing of and then when somebody i think it might have been out i forget who it was said hey this that line of attack is stupid he's actually part indigenous then people got mad on the false claim that he himself was playing that card in order to garner sympathy even though he himself had never played that card it was, I think it might have been Atwood or someone who, who, who was pointing out how ludicrous it was to attack him on that basis. And so the whole thing was insane. Uh, anyway, I sort of been rambling on. Um, well, yeah. And I mean, I, but I guess, I mean, it, it is a really good example of the, the tactics that are used in cancellation. You know, this was a particularly egregious form of cancellation because they really destroyed his life and i mean i i mean that's that's happened to other people who have been canceled also some of us managed to recover a little better but it, it's like they'll they really will just throw out anything it's like okay so he's yeah. a rapist actually and also he's transphobic also he's a white supremacist also he's a fascist you know so on and so forth yeah so in in, in the sort of the kitchen sink aspect of it you're right one aspect that it's not typical um, is that he was an, an actually a, a powerful within again within that milieu he was fairly powerful um, often as you know like sometimes cancel culture these people are bullies they'll go after um, like fairly minor players like you know in the realm of young adult uh, young adult fiction um, or like in the local music industry in Halifax where I've heard some crazy stories like they will go against people who are vulnerable They'd rather go against somebody who has 5,000 followers than 50,000 followers because they can be bullied more. Whereas Galloway, he, yeah, I mean, he was he was fairly powerful with that industry. And the other thing that's worth saying is, like, he wasn't blameless. So, and I don't mean in terms of rape. I don't think he raped anybody. But he, you know, I there was a finding, I think, of sexual harassment. He was having, like, this extramarital affair with somebody who was a student at the school. Um, you know, so... I. At the time, I don't think she was actually in his class, but uh, there's obviously a sort of power imbalance there. So, by yeah, by his own admission, he was kind of like, and he describes himself as being fairly arrogant during that period, and not that he deserved this treatment. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but um, I mean, sometimes cancel mobs like they just go after somebody, some rando who makes a bad joke on Twitter, right? And this wasn't a case of that. There was actually, I tell people, something very Canadian about it because I don't know if if you're familiar with the term um, uh, sort of tall poppy syndrome. Yeah. In in Canada, where when people are successful, when they can't, uh, you know, in certain circles in Canada, like if you're successful enough that you can get by without government grants, without um, institutional support, people get very wary of you because it means like, hey, wait a sec, you can do whatever you want. We can't control you. Um, so if you look like, like you can count on one hand, the number of really popular writers in Canada, right? There's like, you know, Atwood and Jordan Peterson and uh, Galloway and like, <laughs> yeah, like it's quite amazing that, the, that any of them have had any success at all, but you're right. There's really just a few of them. It's not common for a but, can lit writer to yeah. actually make it right. Yeah. And, and by the way, and Jordan Peterson isn't can, he's not a novelist, but, but I don't think it's a coincidence that these people get targeted because people resent their success. Um, there's, there's actually like probably the most successful indigenous, indigenous artist in Canada. Um, uh, his, his name escapes me. It'll come back, come to me later in the show. Um, but he was attacked by another indigenous, uh, an indigenous, indigenous writer in Canadian art magazine 
because this is last year, his paintings were being shown at the Met Museum in, in New York. I, in fact, I, I think in the, in the atrium, uh, so this would be 2019, I guess, in the, in the atrium of the, like just completely incredibly prestigious for a Canadian artist, indigenous or not, to have this gig. And as soon as that happened, the knives came out for him, including among some indigenous artists. And you go on Twitter and there'd be these indigenous artists who were attacking this guy. Now, the basis for the attack, it was always dressed up like, oh, you're sucking up to the colonial settlers and, you know, your your style isn't, you know, indigenous enough and like all this, this stuff. But, but really what it was about was that this is somebody who's successful. He's a tall poppy and they tried to cut him down. Um, and I think... Cancel culture in Canada has a particular flavor to it, and it tends to be a sort of mashup between this ideologically driven progressive mob stuff with old-fashioned Canadian small-town envy-based poppy cutting. And, and the two agendas are very similar because in both cases, it's about identifying a target and taking them down. In one case, it's based on the idea that they think the wrong thing, and in the other case, it's that they're too successful. But if you find somebody who's successful and says the wrong thing, you can kind of like double your money by by going after them on both bases. And, and, it, and it's one of the reasons I think why Canadian cancel culture feels like it's more vicious than in other places, notwithstanding our, our you know, touchy-feely, kind and gentle uh, national stereotype. Well, yeah, and I mean, I think there's just, there's there's less opportunity there are less jobs, so I think people probably feel maybe like they're fighting for scraps. I don't know. I mean, the same that same culture exists within feminism, where when someone becomes kind of too known or they're getting too much attention or something like that, the other feminists will come after them and attack them and try to destroy them and tear them down. Let's say that you're taking up too much space. Um, often it happens when... Um when there's what I call a narrow spigot, like if, if all the funding in a particular industry uh, and in arts, you see this is like, it'll be a small number of funding agencies that are uh, or, or publishers in a particular niche, like poetry or something like that. It's easy to cancel someone because if there's only like three or four institutions or charities or government agencies uh, that mm -hmm. are in charge of the livelihood of these people, if you can get control of those those spigots, then then you can control everything downstream and control who gets jobs and um, and and that's that's often what happens. Um, you know, often these these mob campaigns they're directed at people, but the real audience are the funding agencies and the people who put on literary festivals and stuff. You're basically putting them on notice, like. This person is on our blacklist. So if you're organizing some kind of panel discussion, I cannot tell you how much energy and attention and anger is expended in Canadian arts and letters over these panels uh, at literary festivals where like 13 people show up to see five panelists. It's like <laughs> the weirdest thing. There'll be this like one hour long panel at like the Luminato Festival or, you know, the Emerging Writers Festival or or whatever, and for like the three months before the panel, like friendships will end, um, you know, 8,000 word essays are written, you know, people are getting thrown off Twitter, like just this vicious, vicious fights because person X instead of person Y was picked for this panel that no one cares about. Because these panels, <laughs> like no one listens to the panel, but the whole idea of the panel is that the people up on that stage have been anointed. And so the point of a panel kind of the point is done even before anybody says anything because the fact that they're on stage is like these are the people who have been anointed representatives of our of our art and it, it just makes your jaw drop how much energy is expended on that it's crazy and or getting know, people thrown is, off panels it's crazy yeah <laughs> yeah no i mean it is it's amusing because all for all the drama that goes on in canlet i mean try to explain this or even to say the word canlet to anybody outside of these circles, not even just outside of Canada, even within Canada, because oh, nobody no, yeah. pays attention to this or cares. Like it's just I, not until I got important. to the walrus. I, I mean, look. So I, 
I, and I I'm embarrassed to say I'd never heard of Stephen Galloway as a novelist, um, and I'm, I'm not not a big novel reader. I mostly read nonfiction. Um, like even I was at the Walrus, and I'm a guy who's like supposed to know all these people, and people would be naming these people. I like I have no idea who they were talking about. Or I mean, give you an example. So like I met this when in my old job, I'd meet these people who were very famous in that field. And I met this guy, I was actually introduced to him uh, at this uh, this wine bar on Queen Street, because that was the kind of place I used to go in that life. And this guy was introduced to me as like one of the most successful poets that Canada had ever produced. And And I Googled him. He was like a legitimately, like he actually was a great poet and he had been vetted internationally like he was he was a thing he was he was a well he, he wasn't just like you know um uh you know a local celebrity and i met him and <laughs> he said to me like he had a few drinks and he said you don't get it man i'm like i'm a big deal i've sold eleven thousand books and i was like and i and it's in by the way in the poetry industry eleven thousand books is 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 huge that's like that's big um that's like the Lego movie multiplied by SpongeBob plus Shrek uh, and Star Wars. Like it's a big, big deal. But, you know, Jordan Peterson sells 11,000 books before he wakes up every morning. You know, like Margaret Atwood does the same. Like, so, so it, it's kind of like um, the smaller the stakes, the more bitter the fights. Uh, and and this, is, this is a principle that has preceded mob culture like academic faculty lounge culture has always been like this uh it's one of the mm. reasons i avoided academia is is even well before twitter and facebook academics described these crazy bitter vicious fights in like you know the slavonic languages department of smith college uh or you know, like you know where where 17 scholars in a particular discipline would get together and um and they'd organize you know by the end of it you know eight of them wouldn't be talking to nine of them because they'd had some doctrinal schism over some nonsense. When I actually, when I was at the Walrus, there was a fight. Our, our poetry editor left. I forget the details of this because the Walrus actually published poetry, which like, I mean, I, I can barely get through a limerick. Um, and there was a fight over whether our next poetry editor would be a structuralist or a, like a post-structuralist or... I forget that, but there was like some big schism in the poetry. Like as community. if anybody is even reading this anyway. <laughs> no, well, I don't know. I mean, look, it's apparently. Sorry to be poetry. rude. I'm not interested in poetry either. Okay, I don't know. I, I'm Canadian so, but like, poetry, the, so like... the, the guy I work with there was actually like a good poet and and knew about and cared about it. And like, he taught me a little bit about it, enough to like respect it, even though I'm like a total ignoramus about it. But I learned, it was just fascinating where. The decision of who our next poetry editor was going to be was like this super political decision about whether it was going to be a structuralist or post-structuralist. I'm getting the names wrong. It's not structuralist and post-structuralist. It's like iambic versus post-iambic or whatever, whatever it was. <laughs> but like there was this heated discussion about it. And um, and then like we made the decision and we hired this woman to be the poetry editor. And she seemed like a perfectly nice woman and a good poet. And I'm like, okay. Um, you know, rubber stamp. And, and then I found out like the job paid $5,000 a year and the amount, like when I was a lawyer, we would hire guys like tax lawyers for $300,000 after a 20 minute discussion. You know, when I was an engineer, you know, we'd hire engineers for six figure jobs. Just like, Oh wow, man, look at this. This guy's application is amazing. He did well on his interview. Great. Hey, let's, let's give him a six month contract. Let's try him out. And, if, you know, but I remember we spent like two or three months figuring out whether, whether the poetry community would react well to this, this woman who we picked. Um, it was it was insane. And then and what's weird is like I, by this time I had been in that environment for like a year and it made this weird kind of sense like. It changes you when you're in that environment. These people are telling you, "Oh yeah, this is a really controversial decision." Like we really, and at first you're like, oh, "Fuck you!" Like this is like, you know, get over yourself. But then after you've been in that environment for six months or a year, you're like, "Yeah, this is a big deal." Like, <laughs> like, like you, 
you we can't fuck this one up. <laughs> well, it's um, you know, there's a guy who said something very interesting. But sort of this actually guy in the board of directors of the magazine. He was he he was telling me. He said, you know, John, I've seen so many smart people or people who think they're smart come into organizations because this guy had like started 10 different companies and he said and they always say i'm going to change this place and when they leave it's the place that changes them and it was such a humbling thing because that's exactly what happens is you come in you say like you know i've got all these ideas and the walrus if you look at the walrus now it's exactly the same as it was the day i arrived there it hasn't it's the same i didn't i didn't do anything like i didn't change it at all it snapped right back to what it institutionally was it's and I think that's the case with a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. Including your, so podcast, I, I do, you know, your podcast, I bet you walked in and you said, oh, yeah, I'm going to change, you know, the same drugs. I'm going to change the same drugs. <laughs> gonna, this is going to be yeah, way better. This is not your grandmother's the same drugs. And, you know. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, so I do, I want to talk a little bit more about the specifics of what happened with Stephen Galloway, because one of the major things, I, as I understand it, it, like, you know, one of the major screw ups was what UBC did, like how UBC dealt with it. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think they did so many things wrong. I remember like when I first heard about this in the media, I was completely confused. I, I was like, what happened? I don't understand what happened. Yeah. And I read everything that I could read right. about it in the media. I read like the UBC statements. I read and read and read. I even, I asked around because obviously, you know, the, the Canadian feminists were talking about it. It was like, can someone please tell me what happened? What is everyone talking about? And I couldn't actually get any information anywhere. Well, yeah, and, and that's, so there's two facts, well, at least two facts factors here one is that th there's a pattern and it actually uh it played out around the same time at um uh in the university of california system at berkeley law school uh there was a, a law pro uh, dean there named sujit chowdhury who's, who's canadian and he he got screwed over in the same way um sometimes what happens is an institution screws up with the guy before and then the guy after who's actually innocent pays the price. So at UBC, there had been, I think he was a postdoc. Uh, I think he was, if I remember correctly, he was like a visiting scholar from Russia or something. I forget the details, but like he, he was like a legitimate creep who had done bad things and, and UBC had sat on it and, and had not disciplined this guy. And it was like, the, this wasn't a Galloway situation. It was a guy who, who, who really was bad news and 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 this was before me too and the school screwed up like they didn't take the complaint seriously enough and um and the people involved um you know there was media treatment on it the cbc was doing this stuff uh, i think it was school of secrets or whatever the seat like there was a lot of heat on ubc f for what happened and then along comes galloway and this paper thin allegation comes and you have a lot of people who are like, well, we screwed up the last time. We're not going to screw up this, this time. And that sometimes happens. Again, this happened at, uh, uh, at Berkeley uh, around the same, same time to, um, to a well-known Canadian legal scholar who was victimized by this process. So there was that. And the other thing is, at these university proceedings, one very good thing they do, it's not a good thing they do, but it's a, it's a ruthlessly effective thing they do, is they use institutional pressures to essentially silence the person they're accusing. So, and, and I know people, by the way, uh, in, in Canadian unions and Canadian jobs, I think you and I have a friend in Vancouver who's, who's just, who's, might be uh, being victimized by this process, where what they say is, um, you know, your, your case is being reviewed, uh, don't talk to anybody about it, uh, you're going through a disciplinary committee. Um, if you talk to anybody about it, that, that's like a code one violation of disciplinary committee rules. They'll bring you into these proceedings where you can't bring a lawyer. Um, or you do have a lawyer, but it's the faculty union lawyer. And the faculty union itself, in some cases, is compromised for ideological per reasons. And 
they put you in this box where you can't say anything in your own defense. And the only people who are saying things are on social media saying that you're a rapist. And your own lawyer, if to the extent you have one, is saying you can only get yourself in trouble by talking, so you're not allowed to talk. So the airwaves are just filled with, we were talking about it before, how everyone's bidding each other up. Like, you know, he's a rapist. Oh, he's a transphobic racist. Oh, he's a, he's a racist transphobic racist. Like, he's just, everything gets ramped up. No one is speaking out on your behalf. In the university environment, there isn't, who's going to speak out on your behalf? Uh, Brad Cran, in the article he did for Quillette back in, I think it was 2018, he described like the two or three professors at UBC who actually stuck their neck out for Galloway and they were attacked. You know, the, uh, it was actually pathetic. The school newspaper, the, the UBC or UBC, however it's pronounced, uh, they did an article about like the people who were hurt and traumatized and made to feel unsafe because one of their professors spoke about how Galloway needed due process. Like the professors didn't even say that Galloway was innocent, which he was. <laughs> they said, yeah, you know, due process, this liberal concept, this should be extended to the guy who had the highest position in our school. And that was like triggering to people. Uh, and this was published in the school newspaper run by students. So you have a situation where the students who are supposed to be the rebels, they're supposed to be the people questioning the administration. They're running propaganda for the admin. Like, so you say, well, why wasn't I hearing the truth? Galloway couldn't talk. The few professors who would talk openly on his behalf were being vilified. His own union was probably compromised. The administration was thrilled to see him on the rack because they had screwed up the previous guy and they wanted to get, you know, me too brownie points for uh, running this guy through the gauntlet. And a uh, pack of vicious dogs that these places are, uh, you had a couple of people who are running the place on an interim basis and the way interim directors and deans become full-time directors and deans is if the old guy never comes back. So what happened is some of Galloway's old friends decided like the best career move was to make sure he was out for good and, and they'd, they'd take over the school, which is what happened. I mean, you basically had a, a pack of false accusers who are now kind of running the school. And they put their bets on his guilt. And once you put your bets down on his guilt, where's the currency in going back? It's, oh, we were wrong. You know, turns out I screwed up. Like once you once you go in on that, there's no incentive to admit that you were that you got conned. All of the incentives are to say, um, yeah, are, are to double down on the false accusation. So and, the, you know, but the, there was like a whole inquiry into the situation. Yep. And at the end of the inquiry, it was determined that there that was no was sexual believed. assault. Yeah, 100%. And that was the, uh, uh, as I said, it was Boyd, former, you know, a, a woman for what that's worth, uh, former uh, BC Supreme Court justice. And by the way, she was vilified by, by false accusers. Oh, you know, I don't know what the conspiracy theory was about her. I don't know. Maybe she was like. I don't even know what their logic was, but they attacked her. But her report was not released publicly. So Carrie Gold, she got fragments of it. Uh, Brad Cran, who wrote for Quillette, he got to see parts of it. But all of the proceedings were steeped in this idea that the accuser, like there was so much trauma and pain and all these people coming forward. It was like so traumatic and, uh, you know, they had to be protected. And And by the way, so sometimes these protections are warranted. Like you don't. I mean, in the I mean, most accusations of sexual assault are justified, and and you don't necessarily want to drag uh, all these details, all these people, uh, their names. You know, they may not want these things to be public. I get that. Like, it's not these are not frivolous concerns. Um, but because the document wasn't a public document, you didn't have the Vancouver Sun running excerpts from it. Uh, you didn't have local radio. You didn't have the CBC running stories on it. Um, and the only time these media actually did stories on it were when they were forced to. So, for instance, when Galloway, I think he got $160,000 for breach of privacy and trust from, from UBC. You know, local media had to report that because it was a six-figure payout to Galloway. Um, this, this libel trial, this defamation trial that Galloway is suing about 20 different people, when he wins that, which I think he will, uh, although right now he's at the slap motion stage, uh, they will grudgingly have to report that. But then, you know, 
<laughs> Today's newsrooms are filled with the people who were university students five or six years ago. And, they, you know, especially if you're in Vancouver, you know, the, the young interns and assistant producers at the CBC are people who are undergraduates at the time Galloway was framed. And you think they want their friends on Twitter saying, you know, how could CBC Vancouver run the story uh, about Galloway? Like, you know, just, you know, <laughs> it's such a sellout to, to, to the progressive cause. They don't want to ruin their, their progressive bona, bona fides on, on social media. So um, in a place like Vancouver, you know this better than I do, there, there is this intermingling between the people, the academic crowd and the CBC crowd and the activist crowd. Like it's, if, if you're off message for one, you're off message for the others, right? So you were saying, well, you know, I was checking with all these sources and no one was giving the real, real goods on Galloway. Yeah, you were checking with all these different sources, but those sources are all kind of the same source because they're all crowdsourcing their opinion based on the same social media channels, right? Like there's, there's yeah. one fashionable opinion to have on that subject. And it was so strange to me because it was, you know, when I was asking these questions, and this was again, actually, not that it's about me, but it was sort of an important moment for me because it sort of was what made me feel, it made me lose faith in feminism, the ideology and, you know, the feminist movement that currently exists today. So, and I don't mean the feminist movement throughout history, which is one of the most important movements to have ever existed, but it has accomplished a lot of really, really important things. But, you know, I just, I, it made me start feeling like, I don't know if I want to attach myself to this movement and ideology that doesn't want me to think because I'm asking questions, you know, I'm doing my own research and then I'm asking questions behind the scene and I'm being, you know, vilified in a way simply for asking the questions. You know, I was like, I don't know one way or another. I, I don't know what happened. I don't know Galloway. Not, I don't think any of us know what happened, but you know, you're saying for sure he's guilty. He for sure is a bad guy. You know, these women are all right. Believe these women like, screw him and i'm saying well before i decide that someone's life should be ruined i want to know what his life is being ruined for i want to know if it actually happened and i can't even want that i can't even ask those questions yeah and um it's it's did you see the documentary on nix uh nixium the cult yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and it was it was it was really painful documentary watch because like in that case the guy who ran Nix is, is Nix Nexium is that how you pronounce it? I think it's Nexium. Nexium. So I mean he was a, a scumbag and he was like they had this super creepy thing they were branding people and he was accused of all this like I mean well he's more than accused he's in jail now and rightly so um, and you know everybody all these women and men were like making excuses for him and and it really was this like very cultish thing um where people was like people were gaslighting people who claimed that he was creepy and and, and was a, like this predatory pervert and so you do get these situations where there really is a conspiracy to protect powerful people um and uh, and, and there's, there's, there's fire behind the smoke, but then there's situations like Galloway, which is, which is social panic. And you really have no way of knowing unless you ask questions. And I am skeptical of any movement that says it's just, it's wrong to ask questions or they, you know, they'll say like, you're causing trauma when you ask questions or you're re-victimizing the people when you ask questions. Um, and and this happens. Or it's wrong to want evidence. It's not. It's yeah. wrong to you know you have your opinions and statements supported by evidence because we're just supposed to believe women. That's the and, mantra, right? And, and it's this happens on both among conservatives and progressives. Like they're they're <laughs> they each have these things that you're just supposed to believe. Um, I my theory on this is part of it is an extrapolation of the way families work. So I have some, I know some, some people, friends and acquaintances who like somebody in the family was accused of sexual assault 
like of a child or, you know, really bad stuff. And ultimately, at the end of the day, the family had to choose to believe the accuser and basically never talk to that person again, the, the sexual um, predator. Or they chose to to not believe the accusations and say, look, this is just crazy. Like the story doesn't make sense. We all know Joe, um, you know, we were there the night you talked like this, that didn't happen. Like, you know, so you can, and, and then the family will rally around the person and say, look, we, we don't believe it. It's just, we don't, what you cannot do is half believe the accusations. Um, and which is hard because life is full of doubt. But the way families operate is that when something terrible happens, usually the family, you'll either believe the accusations and es essentially excommunicate the person and not talk to them because he's a creep, or you make the decision, say, look, I don't believe this happened, and this person is, they're still my father, they're still my uncle, they're still my brother, or whatnot. Um, but you have to make a decision, or else family life becomes impossible, because you, you, you can't keep seeing the person and also think they're a rapist. You either think... They're a rapist and never want to see them again, or they're not a rapist and they're still part of the family. And I think that sort of black and white thing, which is kind of sometimes necessary in the way families operate, um, I think that gets applied to like institutions and artistic subcultures where it's like, we're all on the same team. We all have the same hashtags. We're going to make this collective decision. You know, we're all feminists or we're all... Republicans, you know, and 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 you sort of metaphorically treat everybody as a family, and it's like, look, the family has decided that we love Donald Trump, or that we uh, we hate Stephen Galloway, or that uh, trans women are women, or that or whatever. And then once that decision is made, it's seen as such a momentous, defining decision that there is no room for people to say, well, actually, you know what, I I think Donald Trump's a dick, or um, I think Galloway needs due process. Like you're just, it's like there was a family meeting and we decided, you know, uncle Joe gets to come for, for Thanksgiving. And, and no one wants to hear from the guy who says, well, actually, I don't, I don't want to come to Thanksgiving with uncle Joe, you know, um, that's seen as, as, as you're a traitor. Um, but maybe that's the problem. One of the problems with, I don't want to, I don't want to mansplain the problems with feminism but like if you read the literature of feminism one thing that I, I find is like there is a lot of metaphorical references to a sisterhood or you know to solidarity or something like that yeah. um and it it does at least in its literary component feel like an appeal to family values like we're on the same team mm -hmm. we support each other um which sounds great but part of the idea of supporting each other and being on the same team like a family like, you know, the sisterhood, people use that term, is is families make decisions collectively. And you're not allowed to to just say, oh, the hell with it. You know, I, I don't agree with your your decision. And, and that's not just feminism. That's all ideological and political and religious movements. Like, it's just, there's this tension between the individual conscience and what the team has decided, right? Right. And with regard to feminism, it's like, it's about you know, we're in a fight, you know, like it's sort yeah. of like you're in a war and we have to stick together. There aren't enough of us to not stick together. So that means we support one another. And if somebody says this, we've got your back and we support you. But at, at which again, like you say, like it sounds nice. And I participated in this narrative for a long time myself, um, sort of until more recently, but, you know, you know, yeah, because it, it becomes problematic when it's like, well, you've got to support this narrative, even if you think it's wrong or you don't believe it or, you know, it's not it doesn't totally make sense to you. And then you you start to be like, well, OK, I I still I still need to be able to think for myself. I still want to be able to think critically and I don't want to participate in something that I really believe is wrong just because, you know, if this is the sisterhood and this is what right. we do and this is what we decided and this is the right thing for women or whatever it is. Yeah, but it's those are hard decisions to make. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you've read those stories of um, like Hasidic Jews, ultra-Orthodox Jews who uh, there was a guy named... Um, 
Rosen. I forget his, he wrote a great article for me about the Montreal Hasidic community. And uh, I mean, I've read a number of articles like this. There have been documentaries. But often in the interviews, I've actually done some of these interviews myself, where you'll interview a guy who's like, he, he clearly is exasperated by some of the backward aspects of ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Um, like, you know, the, he's not allowed to, to use the internet and he's not allowed to do this and do this and this. And you say to him, you know, I have asked, I have asked ultra-Orthodox Jews this question myself. Like you say to them, like, <laughs> that's crazy. Like just, you know, why don't you just walk away? Like, you know, tell these people to screw off and go, you know, go to university and go do your own life. And he said, like, it's not that easy. You know, these, I love these people and they're my friends and they're my community. And, uh, you know, he says, would you just one day say, you know, to hell with all my friends and family and I'm never going to talk to you again? You probably wouldn't do that. And he's right. Um, and so he wakes up every day and he, you know, he says, well, you know, can I do this? Can I do that? Can I do without that? Can I, yeah, I guess I can do it because that's the price of being with the people who he regards as his tribe, uh, people who love him and he loves them. And, and I mentioned before, like, you know, I was joking about it, that some of the, these, you know, this artistic community, at UBC creative writing and it's, uh, analogous artistic uh, cultures in um, you know all over the Canadian artistic landscape how they're kind of you know like all artists they're a little bit flaky and neurotic and high strung and stuff like that but one result of that is like in some cases these are people who have a lot of pain and trauma and separation in their own personal family backgrounds and the only community they have are other people who are like other you know masters you know creative writing master students at ubc like you know there's like 17 of them or whatever and they're all kind of in this this club uh and and the idea of getting exiled from that club which may be the only sense of solidarity they have like that's really painful mm -hmm. to them you know to the, from the, mm -hmm. to the outside world that club seems really dysfunctional and toxic because you know we see maybe the worst aspects of it on twitter but uh, if you ask somebody in that world, like, do you want to have those people as your friends or do you want nothing? They'll say, well, you know, I, <laughs> it's like kind of, that's the only thing I have. Um, and so I'll do anything to keep that, you know, I'll, so I'll, I'll say that black is white and white is black and Galloway is guilty and men are women and women are men. Like, just tell me what to say and I'll say it so that we can have uh, potluck on Saturday. Like that's, that's the thing they look forward to is being with those people. Um, and, and so I have a certain amount of sympathy for those individuals. Um, but I think their situation is a situation where they don't have other options. Uh, you know, they may have a fragmented family background or their personality types are such that they can't really make uh, enduring relationships outside those subcultures, and and also like some often their 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 boyfriend or their girlfriend uh, is in that world. Like a lot of times, these dramas are intermingled with romantic relationships in really unhealthy ways. Um, and so, if if you part ways with these with this crowd ideologically, you also you lose your boyfriend or your girlfriend, or and and you lose your livelihood because you're not going to get your teaching contract renewed. So um, <laughs> it's, it's easy for you and me to say, oh, yeah, let's just walk away from all this stuff um, because maybe we've organized our life in a way that we're not dependent on these cliques. Um, mm -hmm. But if, if you are dependent on it, it's, it's tough. It's, it's, it's very tough to ask these people to do that. Yeah. I, I wanted to talk about the, you know, the Me Too aspect. And I think that one thing that's gotten lost in, I mean, I think there's, there's a couple of things at play here. One of, one of them is that the feminist mantra, believe women is, is such that, you know, and, and in general, it's, it is good to believe women because of course there's this long history of women not being listened to or believed when they come out and say that they've been sexually assaulted. It's been really, hard for women to talk about it publicly so feminism has done a lot of work to encourage women to come out and talk about you know what a man has done to them abuse sexual assault what have you sexual harassment things like that 
Um, that's been a majorly important part of the feminist movement and in terms of women, you know, getting justice and, and being able to hold perpetrators to account. Um, but that push combined, I think, with social media has created a culture where there's very little understanding for young women in terms of repercussion and they're encouraged to to speak out online specifically um, in a way that neglects to understand that, you know, this is still like a legal issue, like this is still a crime. So, you know, I think Carmen, sorry, I'm going to say her last name wrong. I just realized I don't think I've actually said her name out loud ever before. Carmen Aguirre, is that how you say her last name? um, She's from Argentina originally. Yeah, anyway, uh, so she... Vancouver based. She's in Vancouver. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And but she she wrote an article for Brad Cran's Substack and and she pointed out something that I think maybe women or especially young women have forgotten which is that if you're going to accuse somebody of a major crime in the reckless this is her quote in the reckless absence of proof you are entering into the legal arena. Like I think and I think right. I, honestly I think I've been guilty of this too where it's like you know, I'm going to come out and say this online because it's important and this guy is a terrible person and maybe people should know about it. But, you know, you then have to be accountable for what you said, right? Yeah. Yeah, and Carmen is an interesting example because uh, if I remember correctly, uh, she wrote a book like she was, I think she was raped in a, like in a park at gunpoint. Um, like her her own experience with rape is... Um, you know, it's not like <laughs> she wasn't traumatized by, you know, being mobbed on Twitter. Like she was, um, it, it was, you know, tragically, it was like the, the most apocalyptic example of what you would think of as like a violent sexual assault. And she's written about it. Um, and I think sometimes she has, she has referred to that when she, sometimes she'll, she'll get called called out by other people saying oh you know you have the wrong views on galloway you know don't you understand rape culture and she'll say well i think i understand rape culture pretty well like i for me it wasn't rape culture it was it was rape um the thing about what we've done with that is we have to decide is sexual assault a horrible horrible crime and most people say it is or is it something you can casually accuse a person of in the same way that you accuse them of having a, a personality flaw? And it can't be both. Mm-hmm. Because if if it's a crime that a person can go to jail for for 20 years, then it can't also be something we discuss in the same way that we discuss, like, oh, that person has no sense of humor. Or, you know, oh, I, I heard that person did this, like, through hearsay. And analogously the same is true of racism where if you look at the public discussion about racism racism is is either the worst thing in the world the foundational evil of of society or it's something so casual that you could accuse a person of being a racist in like the comment thread of somebody else's twitter feed and it's like well you know you got to make up your mind it's one or the other i mean i personally think racism is pretty bad but if it's pretty bad, it also has to be taken seriously. And if you're a college student, if you're a woman in particular, in many cases, you will have been encouraged, like in creative writing classes, in college application essays, in um, like um, in theater, in any kind of, of creative endeavor you're often encouraged to like give voice to traumatic things that have happened to you. Like describe the challenges you've overcome. Like it's become, I mean, I see it with my daughters. It's like, you know, they write essays for high school or whatever. And it's often it's like, you know, describe like a moment you felt victimized or described a moment you felt powerless or, and, and they're encouraged to, to search their experiences. And sometimes this is a very healthy thing. Like sometimes it's therapeutic to look for things that, that have victimized you. But if you see that this is the currency of the realm uh, on social media, it can become very unhealthy, like on Tumblr or um, 
you know, in a creative writing environment where, you know, a couple of years ago, like at UBC or something like that, you know, there was like these literary uh, milieus, they go through crazes, you know, like you have, oh, well, like now we're doing like kind of like slave memoirs or now we're doing, you know, rape books or now we're doing LGBT books and now we're doing like, you know, vampire stuff. I remember 15 years ago, there was like, there was this whole vampire thing. And if you see people getting big book contracts for writing about sexual assault, um, like that, that changes that you, you start to think of it as, well, yes, it's a traumatic experience, but it's also this thing that people around me are being rewarded for talking about. And we're not in court, you know, they're not being cross-examined. They're just speaking from the heart and they're speaking from their experiences. And, and as you say, that can be very dangerous where people are, are saying things that they're describing serious crimes, sometimes in a way maybe that's like very casual uh, with, and if there is no evidence, yeah, it can be defamation. Well, and I mean, that has a, a detrimental impact then in, well, in in a few different ways, but in one of the ways is that now I think people take these kinds of things, including accusations of racism, less seriously, including, you know, when, when you're going around calling everybody white supremacists, when they're not literally it's actually it's white, white yeah. supremacists, then I mean, are we taking white supremacy seriously? Because we should be taking white supremacy seriously. And same thing with, with rape. I, you know, I, if I, rape I is a really you. horrible crime, as you say, then we should be taking it seriously. And it shouldn't be thrown around in this way that makes people skeptical. So now, you know, I worry that people will hear about an accusation and their reaction won't be like, oh my God, that's terrible. It'll be like, well, really did it, you know? Look, the white supremacist thing is, to me, is an example of uh, verbal inflation. I'm older than you. I remember when I was a kid, well, you probably remember it, like maybe 10 years ago, like white supremacists meant, you know, apartheid era South Africa. It meant Nazi. It meant like white supremacists meant, um, you know, like Belgian Congo. It, it meant the real deal. Uh, white supremacist now, I don't even know what it means because if you read like your typical essay on, you know, in Vox or Slate, like white supremacism is like, I had a bad day or, uh, you know, I've seen like Seinfeld be accused of white supremacism. Like it, and, and again, these things go through fads. Like, you know, there was a fad, you know, fascism, uh, or racism, and, and, you know, or, or the right wing, you know, that's, um, everything was linked to Islamist terrorism. After 9-11, uh, you know, we talk about this sort of with us or against us mentality. This with us or against us mentality existed on, on the right side of the spectrum uh, during, uh, after 9-11, where like, anything you said that was seen as ideologically incorrect, it was like, well, you're giving, you're giving comfort to the terrorists or you know, you're, um, you're, you're weakening us in our struggle against militant Islam. Like you often will see these, these ideological manias play out like during, during wartime or during conflict. And, and also, and the language gets very inflated. I mean, that's, that's another aspect of this. Um, but I don't, I don't know how to rescue the language. Like if white supremacist just means there aren't enough black people in this theatrical production or, um, you know, Trudeau, Justin Trudeau himself is always talking about uh, institutional racism, and white supremacy. Like, I do think people blank out. Like, I do think people think it's meaningless because mm -hmm. if you're using it to describe something that's invisible and unfalsifiable, like it's now considered white supremacists to demand proof of white supremacy. Like that marks you as a white supremacist. So I think the average person on the street, to the extent they're even following this, is like, it's all, it's all, it's all bullshit. And so what, what terms do you use when something really is white supremacist? Like, it's like you have to invent a new vocabulary to, discuss, to, to actually describe stuff that actually 10 years ago is what these words describe. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the specifics of the lawsuit. So Stephen Galloway filed a defamation suit against 
like two dozen people. Uh, do you know who they are? Uh, at one point I saw the list and there's the list. It's, um, it includes a couple of people from within the UBC milieu, including, mm -hmm. I think Galloway's former mentor, uh, one of the, certainly at least one of the profs at UBC, um, and a, f a few people who are in the, uh, Canlit environment. Uh, and then I think one or two people who were, who were kind of just social media randos who just doub kept doubling down on this rape stuff. Um, I think all in all, there's about 20 defendants. And right now it's at the slap motion stage, which is this, this sort of... Um, a couple of years ago, they introduced this, uh, this measure that people could invoke to preempt a defamation claim if uh, you know they had been speaking out in the public interest, and this was just an, the defamation claim was just an attempt to shut them up. Um, unfortunately, this whole slap, uh, the procedure itself, is now a trial in and unto itself, which was exactly the kind of <laughs> thing that the, the institution was meant to to preempt. Um, but that's what Brad Cran's been reporting on. Like people. It's easy to mistake this for the actual trial, but in fact, they're not even at the trial stage. They're just at the slap motion stage. Although, if we, I think if Brad, if I think if Galloway wins the slap motion thing, a lot of the defendants will settle because they don't want to go to a full trial because they know they're going to lose. So, in a way, I okay. think this might be for some of the defendants at least the actual. If effectively, this is the actual trial. Okay, and Brad Cran wrote that this case will likely turn out to be the most important trial in the history of Canadian defamation and a milestone in arts and culture. Do you think that's true? Uh, <laughs> I think it's absolutely 100% true if the media reports it properly. And I think, I think once there's a court judgment, or when people start actually reaching settlements with Galloway, they will report it because those are the things that, that are very difficult to ignore. Like if Galloway is getting hundreds of thousands of dollars, it's hard not to report that. And if, if, if there's an actual judgment, it's hard not to report that because the judgment will, is, will be public and the judgment will contain the names of everybody. See, that's another thing is that for a lot, even some journalists who do want to report on it, there's this whole dance they have to do, like you can name this person, but not this person. You can talk about this evidence, but not that evidence. Um, and so maybe they're just they're, some some people are just waiting for the judgment to be rendered. And when it is rendered, it's going to be a big deal because it's going to be a big deal for the reason you just described, where there's this this whole generation of of people on social media who are just casually accusing people of being rapists and stuff like that, and when this happens, like when this judgment comes down or when these settlements are reached, that's going to be an example where people are going to say like, you might want to delete that tweet. You know, someone, someone like you tweeted something like that about Galloway and they had to fork over a hundred thousand dollars or whatever that, that can sober you up pretty quick. Right. So it'll create a precedent perhaps that will get people to think twice. The interesting question is even if this, litigation results in Galloway getting a hundred percent victory. He's never going to get his old job back. And there are people in Canlet who will never talk to him again in their, their, their lives because it will actually make things worse for them that he was right. Like they will forgive him for being guilty, but they will never forgive him for being innocent because the fact that he will prove that he's innocent through this defamation trial, um, it makes them look like idiots. It it it, it disgraces mm -hmm. them, and it makes them more vindictive, and they will want to double down on their disgrace of him. There's absolutely no winners in this. Um, the woman who accused Galloway of, of these false allegations, she's completely disgraced. Her, I mean, I'm not using her name because I don't want to appear in the pleadings, but you know, her name is Mud. Um, the uh, this woman Chelsea Rooney, who who essentially became this person's spokes spokeswoman, and she became like um, a real cultist in her false accusation um, 
cult. Uh, I think she looks ridiculous. She was the one person singled out by Boyd as being uh, an evasive and non-credible witness. Um, all of these people who have doubled down, I mean, in many cases, they're going to be completely impoverished. Like some of the people who are going to have to pay out to Galloway, like even if Galloway gets a relatively modest, like, I don't know, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars dollars $50,000, a lot of these people, that's what they make in a whole year. Um, I mean, this is going to be a real financial hardship for them. And um, UBC creative, a creative writing program has been completely disgraced. The, there are absolutely no winners in any of this. And, and also, like, women who legitimately have Me Too stories, who really have been sexually assaulted, they will unfairly have their narratives, doubt will be cast on them, maybe implicitly, because people will say, oh, yeah, I remember what happened to Galloway. Um, and Galloway's life will never be the same. Um, I think he'll eventually he'll no, start. No, I mean I don't think. Do you th I mean I don't think he'll get his career back. Do you? It'll be a different kind of career. Like so, if you look at the kind of careers of people who've been canceled, they tend to be different kinds of. Like, look at your career. I mean, you're you're more famous now than you were five years ago. Uh, I'm guessing you're probably making more money, but it's a different kind of career. You're not in the sisterhood now. Like you've created your own sisterhood. Uh, or my career is different. Like, you know, five five years ago, I, I was, that's right, I was a card-carrying member of Canlit, but, you know, I had a big office and I'd go to wine bars and all this stuff. And like, you know. I mean, I'm, I have ha I have had to be completely independent. I'm completely yeah. independent. Yeah. You know, I really yeah. am just, I'm, I'm kind of on my own. And that's not to say I don't have support, but I certainly don't have the same kind of support where I once was. I'm not working with other people and groups in the I same remember, way that I did you know, in the past. It used to be you'd write for Rabble. And by the way, you're not going to get rich writing for Rabble, but it was a, a, a no. like you were part of the sort of institutional, loosely organized Canadian feminist uh, activist literary scene. Um, yeah. And, and I, well, I was still part of the left then. You know, I still... Or Brad I still felt, and I still felt allegiance to the left, and I still felt allegiance to the feminist movement, and you know things are so. But the good and the bad, because you know there are good parts about those. You know Brad Cran, I think Brad Cran used to be like the poet laureate of of Vancouver, and and Brad Cran used to have like he was vice president of the. Oh God, I'm going to get the name wrong. It's like uh, the Women's Feminist Writers Club. Like his his girlfriend was was the president of it or something like that. Like he. He was tied up in all this stuff. And Brad Cran, I, I, I think, I get the sense he's now a much happier and more successful person than he was five years ago. But it's a different kind of success. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a more independent uh, type thing. You, you know, you got to have your elbows out because there's always these, you know, sour grapes from, you know, your old institutional cohorts coming after you. Um, you know, you see this with... Um, you saw it with Jamie Kilstein for a bit. Like, there's a lot of writers at Quillette. Mm -hmm. who, you'll see this with Toby Young. I mean, Toby Young, who's my colleague at Quillette, a couple of years ago, you know, he was in the whole wine bar scene and he was um, meeting with government officials and being interviewed by Fancy Magazine, which I guess he still is being interviewed, but, like, he's just more of a rebel now because once you breach, like... At first, it's like, oh, this sucks. I'm on my own. And then after like a year or two, you're like, oh, this is great. I'm on my own. But it's more of an eat what you kill type environment. Whereas instead of people bringing you your meals on a platter, you you go out and eat what you kill. And, and you have more weapons at your disposal. And you have more energy to do it because you're doing what you believe in. But it's a, it's a more rough and tumble kind of life. I mean, I don't. I think you know this yeah. better than me. Probably. I mean, you're much more. You're much. You're much more insecure. Here, I mean, I I like it better because I like to have I like to be independent and I like the freedom. Well, you know, I I can do what I want <laughs> like and say what I want. Yeah. yeah. Well, but, I no. mean, yeah. and you're marginally good. successful, but I'm never gonna you know and it, like it's like I'm never gonna pitch to the CBC again, which is fine. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, I don't need well, to. But you know, like <laughs> I mean, can you imagine pitching to the CBC in 2021? <laughs> like. I Can mean, you I'd imagine rather... if I pitched to the CBC and <laughs> no, but like, like even if They'd you were like, Megan uh -huh. Murphy and I weren't, <laughs> even if we were different people, can you imagine how like mortifying 
and awful that process is that now like where the place has just become so afraid of its own shadow and 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 such a snake pit. i mean you you read the stories of like even like no one is woke enough um and there's you know you're always one syllable and one pronoun away from being excommunicated no you know you could be like a completely doctrinaire orthodox progressive wokester for the last like 10 years and you slip up once and the knives are out. like the nice thing about the life of of a sort of like someone like us is like i could say the wrong thing on this podcast i could get someone's pronoun wrong you know I could get someone's religion wrong or make a bad joke. And like you're <laughs> you and the people who listen to this are not going to be like, Oh my God, did you hear what Jonathan K said? Uh, I right. Still, you know, right. like they're going to be like, we treat each other as human beings because we are not in a doctrinaire movement. We don't see ourselves as foot soldiers in some cult. And yeah. And, and that's why, and, and that's why the danger is like, you know, so a lot of people who've written for Quillette, there are people who are exiled from the, the the left and I see them and they write for Quillette and some of them have kind of just kept going and become, they're part of the right. Like they, they, they went in for Trump and, you know, they became like super conservative. And I, I talked to them. I say like, you traded one cult for another cult. What's up with that? Like, do you think this cult is going to end up better than the other one you were in? Um, and and I I kind of like where I'm at now, where everyone's equally pissed off at me. But I think the biggest one of the biggest mistakes you can make is say, I got I got excommunicated from this political cult, so I'm going to go to the opposite political cult, and you'll see, you'll get yours. Like I'll get my revenge. It's like no, that's not the way to get revenge. That's the way to get fed up with another cult. And five years from now, you'll be a leftist again because you'll get fed up with the right. Like it's. I, yeah i mean and what i mean what you said earlier i mean the the good thing about being canceled if you can navigate it and sort of come out you know i guess independently and and persevere and you don't crumble under that kind of stress and and pressure is that you do manage to cultivate an audience if you're in media or, you know, a community or a friend group of people who don't behave like that towards you, partly because they know it won't work on you. you know, like, you know, people don't respond to the content that I produce in the way that they would respond if I were somebody else, because A, they, they know who I am and they followed my work long enough to know what to expect. And they know that I don't play those games and that it won't work on me. You know, I don't, I won't say something that I don't believe well, in just they trust because I feel because pressured. You're yeah. I mean, but look, when I, when I, the reason I don't watch the CBC news isn't because I think the people producing the CBC news or anchoring it are dumb. I don't think they're dumb. Uh, you know, I've, I, I appear on the CBC for many years and I, the people there are super smart people. They're talented. Many of them are well-meaning. Um, the reason I don't trust what I'd see on the CBC news is because they are subject to institutional and ideological pressures and the words coming out of their mouths, especially on certain subjects. I don't believe that they believe that they mean those things. I, I, I believe they are saying things and reporting things. They're using language. They don't believe they know it's artificial um, and they have to, because that kind of institutional environment is, is now currently in a cultural state where these people have no choice. And the people who I trust on the left and the right are usually working for media outlets where I know that they're not going to say a single thing that they don't actually believe. Like, I know that when I'm watching your podcast, it's not like, oh yeah, there goes Megan Murphy again, you know? serving the turf agenda because big turf told her what to say like you know like you're you are a turf but you're like it, you come by it honestly <laughs> and like i don't i actually don't mind listening to like transgender activists if i really think they believe what they're saying um like i i know i have friends who are trans activists and if they're sincere that they believe this stuff even if i disagree with it I have a lot of time for anybody who sincerely believes this stuff. I would rather listen to like a super sincere trans activist than listen to somebody whose views were closer to like, you know, my own turfitude, 
but I thought that like they were putting it on because they wanted to be on, on on Joe Rogan or something like that. Like, um, and 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 so sincerity, you, you know, look at Barry Weiss. I mean, uh, Barry Weiss is making a mint with her Substack. Mm -hmm. Not just, I mean, not just because she's a great writer and a great editor. But because when you go to Barry Weiss's Substack, you know you're getting the unvarnished Barry Weiss. And um, whereas when I read the op-ed page of the New York Times, and she used to work in that environment, sometimes I read an op-ed in the New York Times, I mean, you can actually see the way the, you can, if you know, you can see the way the piece was edited to conform to a certain ideology. And even if you agree with it or don't agree with it, it's like, why am I reading this? I don't trust the source. I don't trust that they're being sincere with me about their views because of the environment in which they work. Um, and so it's, in some ways, the small shop, like the one-man podcast, the one-woman podcast, Quillette only has five or six people working there. We have the advantage, because as these places get bigger, they become institutionalized, and institutions create their own dogmas and their own hypocrisies. And once that happens, that's when people like you and me leave because we, we can't handle that. Like if Quillette had 50 people working for it, I'd leave because it would develop, it just happens. Like it, it happens that these places develop uh, their own humbug. And sometimes it's ideological. Sometimes it's just institutional. There's a lot of places that have no ideology, but they're just like, they're risk averse. And so you can't do the kind of stories you want. Uh, and that's why mm -hmm. Substack is changing the game. I mean... Uh, and that's why people are afraid of Substack. Just like, oh my God, Barry Weiss can go to Substack and make half a million dollars a year and just write anything she wants. That's crazy town. We can't allow that. Like, it makes people nervous. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, people and are. Also, and people have been freaking out about Substack and kind of trying to go after Substack because people yeah. like Barry Weiss and Matt Taibbi and Glenn Greenwald you know, yeah. Andrew Sullivan, like, like Andrew you say, Sullivan. I mean, they're, yeah. they're doing really well there and they're there's probably enjoying reason. themselves a lot more than they were when they were working for these institutions. And, and there's another reason that people resent it. It's because there's no hiding who's popular and who's not popular. Like if Bear, if, if, if Andrew Sullivan is making 600,000, I think he's making at least 600,000 a year on Substack. Like, there's no getting around the fact that Andrew Sullivan is super popular and people hate that shit. Whereas if some pronoun poet sets up a substack, like, if that pronoun poet writes for Slate, they can pretend they're actually popular and people actually give a fuck what they think. But when you go on substack, it's like, okay, start your own substack. See how many people subscribe. And it's like, oh, shit, no one, wa no one wants to hear your garbage. Well, it you can't can't you can't say like oh nobody likes andrew sullivan like he's only being propped up because he's like a white man with you know like he's being supported by these other right. this like white male institution or whatever you, you can't dismiss people right and you know it, similarly people would dismiss me i don't know how but they they like to call these people grifters or they're like oh they're only they're only on there because it provides clickbait or something like that and it's like Oh, I guess not because this person went fully independent and he's more popular than ever. It's because people genuinely want to hear what he has to say. They now, genuinely yeah. enjoy reading his writing. Agreed. Now, I mean, let's let's be honest. It is possible to go independent and publish garbage and get millions of eyeballs. Like, you know, you could create your own Perez Hilton or uh, Gawker. Uh, uh, you know, there are examples of sites that make people rich that that publish, uh, you know, bottom feed Garbage, and stuff. okay, okay. But yeah. if you go okay, to Barry fair. Weiss or Andrew <laughs> Sullivan, like you're not seeing pictures of topless celebrities. Like you're seeing densely argued arguments about the biggest issues of our day. So, and it drives people crazy because there is this, like one of the conceits of, of progressive online culture is like, we're the next wave, we're what people want, you know, um, Yes, we all write exactly the same thing for different outlets, and we all have exactly the same opinions because that's the opinion that like everyone wants to hear. But then, if you break it down on the atomic level, writer by writer, and you don't hide behind institutional labels like Vox and Vice and Slate, and it's like okay, let's look at the numbers. That scares me, and it should scare them.
because the fact is we do have an oversupply in a, in, in a certain kind of journalism. Uh, and here in Canada is bad where, I mean, Canada, you have like 30 magazines no one's heard of that are all running the same stuff. And if you took away the government subsidies and gave all of those people sub stacks, they'd all have like 10 subscribers. And, and that, yeah, I think that scares them more than the fact that turf Nazis like us can write whatever we want on Substack. Like it's what scares them more the most isn't that we're going to be popular as I think it's fair to say we are popular. What, what scares them more is that using the same media, everyone's going to realize that no one actually wants to read what they have to say. And that's, and that is scary because they've been propped up with all kinds of institutional support and, uh, and you know, well, and they've, you know, they're, they're comfortable sharing these sort of regurgitated, not very well thought out takes and or reporting, you know, commentary, what have you. And maybe they haven't developed the ability to think critically or actually do really good, you know, unbiased, fair reporting or, you know, really to process things and to come out with an authentic, thoughtful, intelligent perspective. And, you know, that probably scares them too. Like, and I, cause I, like, I know how easy it is to churn out that stuff. I got to a point in my career where I felt like I was churning things out and that's why I switched paths. Like at Rabble. It's just too easy. And I was like, no, I need to be challenging myself and I want to be challenging myself. I don't, if to, to, to emphasize a lot of these people, and we're, we're talking about these people, like this sort of faceless work, a lot of these people, they're, they're super smart people. Um, and a lot of these people don't maybe don't belong in, in journalism or writing. Um, because once you take away these institutional reward systems and the government subsidies and stuff like that, maybe like often in many cases they they have flourishing careers as as chefs or artists or firefighters or carpenters or um, I mean there is like again I, this is more in the spirit of sympathy like there's a whole cohort of people in their twenties or thirties now who are very creative people who could have been good at many things but like they've been encouraged to be writers or poets or whatever, because that's like seen as, as a real aspirational thing, but maybe it's not even something they really wanted to do. They just kind of like people were telling them that. And mm -hmm. as long as the money is there because they're getting the grants or, you know, they're, they have an associate prof gig in creative writing at some university, they kind of just keep trundling along. Uh, sometimes for those people pulling that, that support system away is, it can be the best thing that happened to them because they realize it wasn't making them happy because they weren't being authentic. Um, in the short term, it's wrenching. It's hard to make changes. But if you're just spouting propaganda that you think is ideologically fashionable instead of speaking your authentic opinion, you're in the wrong field. And you're not going to be a happy person until you change. Definitely. So. Um, I mean, so I think one of the concerns around, you know, I've, I've read this um, online. Uh, one of the concerns around these kinds of defamation lawsuits um, that Stephen Galloway has launched is that it could, they could have a chilling effect yeah. um, in terms of women's willingness to come forward about sexual assault. And that's not, that's not, I don't regard that as a frivolous complaint. Um, and there are many, like I'll give you an extreme example. In Brazil, anyone who criticizes President Bolsonaro or like his ruling clique, they have this weird legal system. I'm hardly an expert on the Brazilian legal system, but I read this article in the Times about it where they have this system where like you can sue a person in every area of Brazil. And if you're a defendant, you have to get a lawyer in each of those areas. So you have these people who have criticized Bolsonaro and they're being bankrupted because they have to hire like 20 lawyers because they'll get sued by these plutocrats in, in all of the legal jurisdictions of Brazil. And that's an example, and that has nothing to do with sex or feminism or anything like that, but it's just an example of how wealthy people can chill speech. And so if you're in Brazil, you might just keep your mouth shut. Um, and another form of chilling speech is um, before there were rape shield laws, if you accuse a man of rape, he could drag your entire sexual history in front of the court, open court, 
um, make you describe like the kind of sex you had with with every boyfriend you've ever had. And and this was a tactic that was used to discourage women from coming forward. There are many there are many different tactics you can use to chill speech or to prevent people from seeking justice. So this is legitimate. And in fact, this this the slap process we've been talking about, this was designed to um, to prevent people from using vexatious or bad faith defamation suits to chill legitimate political discourse on matters of, of um, public interest. Where I think it's being used in a cynical way here by the person accusing Galloway of, of, of rape falsely is that it's one thing to say women should be free and be encouraged to come forward with their experiences of sexual assault and, and to get hold men accountable and to have them prosecuted and if found guilty, sent to jail. We want that to happen. But if you get to the point where you insist that your own, the, the details of your particular accusation of rape, which have been rejected and which are dubious and have been shown to be um, uh, like without any evidence whatsoever in, in this investigation that UBC commissioned, if you get to the point where you say, well, notwithstanding the fact that like I have no real evidence and uh, I, I should still be able to say all this stuff because it's in the public interest. If the court finds in favor of Galloway's false accuser in this case, it will basically mean that you can accuse anybody in British Columbia of rape and even if there's no basis whatsoever, the person can never hold you to account for defamation because you say, oh, sorry, you know, it's in the public interest. I'm, you can't chill my feminist speech. Like there has to be a point at which the accusations are so baseless that you're taking the speech out of the realm of politics or the public interest or activism. And it's basically just telling flat out lies about innocent people. Like they're, there has to be that dividing line. And if there isn't that dividing line, it means any person, and not just a man, a woman, like there's, you know, women can rape people too. It's, it's uncommon, but it does happen. Then, then anyone can be accused of rape and they have no retribution, even if they're falsely accused, on the basis that rape accusations are inherently in the public interest in terms of protected speech. That, that can't be where the law is. Like I... I mean, I suppose the judge can can decide the case in unpredictable ways, but I can't imagine that we'll get to the stage that that's where the law is. So, do you 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 know Stephen Galloway at this point? Yeah, and he's a lot of the descriptions that we have of of myself and yourself, like the answer to him. I mean, but like multiplied by a hundred, like <clears throat> you know. <laughs> he at his lowest point he was uh like he was institutionalized by the state of ohio because when this whole thing happened he was traveling i think he was going to give like a book reading and in ohio i think oberlin i forget where it was but the university had him locked up they they called and said oh yeah you know put this the whole thing was so cynical uh he was suicidal i mean he went from like the height like the absolute star of that literary culture to it's like devil in the space of of 24 hours so by the time i met him i spent some time with him in vancouver like you know a couple of years had passed and it's you know because of the nature of his ordeal he could never speak out like with you know i mean i had like a minor thing like when i left the walrus there was a whole minor thing but like I was, I, I think the next day I wrote an article about it for the National Post. Like I was tweeting about it. I was having, like, I was being my ordinarily obnoxious self about it. And, you know, you've always been your obnoxious self about it. Like, but in his case, it was really rough because everyone, including his own lawyer, was saying, you have to shut up about it. You're not allowed to talk. Imagine how frustrating. Uh, and it was I, similar to maybe like, I mean, in some ways, like when they took away your Twitter account, it must have been like that. I mean, because this was by then you didn't have like a YouTube audience. You, you didn't have maybe you hadn't used Facebook as much. And 
you know, yeah. since then you've never you defend yourself. And right. I actually, when I was working for rabble and they tried to get me fired from rabble with that, that whole petition that happened back in 2015, um, I was sort of told not in any legal sense, but I was told or pressured to essentially not speak about it yeah. online and speak about what was going on, which was frustrating. And I mean, that's on a smaller scale, but yeah. And I mean, not having a Twitter account just means, you know, Twitter, Twitter libeled me. They said things about me on Joe Rogan and about what happened with my um, getting suspended that weren't true. And, you know, I'm not, and you don't, you're not able to defend yourself. It's not, I don't think it's quite as bad because, you know, I still, I d did start like a public Facebook page and a public Instagram page, which I didn't really want to. And those those platforms don't really, right. that but information do. doesn't travel in the same way. So, I mean, yeah. And in in, um, in Gallo's case, like his own lawyer was saying, like, you can't say a syllable about, about, uh, about anything. Like, it's not even about the platform. And, and years went by where he didn't say anything about it. Super rough. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, and by the time I met him, like... It wasn't at the depths. And he's also, he was with a very supportive partner and his litigation was well advanced. And we had written, I think Rag Cran's article in Quillette was, was kind of a game changer for him a little bit too. Then he, around the same time, he, he wrote the big tell-all for the National Post. Um, but it took him years and, and it was a really rough process. But I saw in him sparks of of this thing we're talking about where it's like it is kind of liberating to be like there were you know when he was living that life there were things about that culture that he hated and he thought were shallow and so but he couldn't say anything about it because he was benefiting from it um yeah, right, right right and once you're out yeah you know it's limiting some, it's it's very limiting uh and um so i was happy and i was actually like He's actually, he was really fun to be with. And I got the sense that had I been with him when he was still the head of the creating, creative writing department, he would have been like a, a dick. Because right. everyone was sucking up to him. Like he spent his whole day people sucking up to him. And that makes you a dick. Uh, yeah. I can, I can attest that that makes you a dick. Yeah, I mean, it, it it is it is one of those things where like it is a cliche, but I absolutely think it's true. It's been true in my personal history for sure that you know hardship, like you come out better on the other end, and it sucks and it's stressful and it can be really depressing. And hey, you know, it, there there's always some, huh? Speaking of hardship, I I got I don't think oh. there's any, so. This <laughs> is my vaccine about your vaccine. Yeah, so I'm old and I got vaccinated, and you're not, so you haven't been vaccinated. So yeah, well, I'm young and healthy. Sucks to be you. I'm still, I'm, I'm passing as 29 over here. I'm oh yeah, okay. <laughs> I anyway, <laughs> I so I got my vaccine. What is it? Uh, five hours ago, and I'm told that around now it's AstraZeneca, so now is around the time mm -hmm. like I'm going to get chills and I have to put on my nightcap and take my Tylenol and stuff like that. You grow a third arm. <laughs> so anyway, so I got, I got to go. I have to convalesce. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. I got it. This is your, how you're trying to get out. You're not just bragging about your vaccine to me. I am kind of, I'm kind of, I mean, I don't, I'm kind of bragging good for bit. you. Congratulations. Thanks. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, when I hope that, I hope that, uh, that changes something for you in your life or, <laughs> yeah. Well, I am. Gonna, I don't know. Canada is just getting. This is a whole other. I'm, I'm going I'm, I'm <laughs> like, to metrize it and put it on a lanyard, so that I'm. Gonna, you should go get some people to spit in your mouth or something like that. I don't know <laughs> if you've been missing that this whole time. You know, um, people can start yelling in my face again. <laughs> no, but I'm going to miniaturize this and get it like laminated and put it like around my neck, like um, because because we are going to live in a society where I'm convinced that. Like, I want to go to the States over the summer. I'm going to have to show it. It's going to be like this pass you show. So it's yeah. going to be my, my backstage pass to a world of, of, of fun and adventure that you can only imagine. 
It's, uh, I can't imagine. You should move <laughs> to Mexico, and then you might be able to imagine a sliver of the fun and adventure I'm experiencing over here vaccine-free. It, it does sound fun. <laughs> it does sound fun. <laughs> Okay, well, it was really good to talk to you. Um, I, like I said, I've been wanting to talk about this for a really long time, so I'm glad to be able to cover it with uh, someone who's been following it so closely all along. And I, you know, I hope the best for Stephen. I hope that he comes out on top. I hope that he's able to regain some form of a career that's... Oh, no, no I don't... Yeah, I don't think sure. that's going to be an issue uh, eventually. Although I think it's going to be... He's going to have to do it... Um, like in my case... I don't think it's a coincidence that I'm working for an Australian publication now, Quillette. And, um, and I think like a couple of years from now, or maybe sooner, you know, he'll be writing, it, it won't be for a Canadian outlet. He'll be, you know, it'll be for a, an American publisher um, or, uh, or British or something like that. But I mean, he's too big a talent for, for this to keep him down forever. He's also, I mean, on the other hand, he's also going to get a lot of money from this defamation suit. I mean, he may just join you in Mexico and you guys will just like be partying all the time. Uh, Highly recommend. I mean, I think, uh, I think it might be like some kind of CBC buddy comedy in the works. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think. That would be hilarious. Because I bet Stephen he speaks Galloway Spanish. Back. Unlike you, I bet he speaks <laughs> Spanish. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I know. I feel, I, I'll keep working on it. I do feel really ashamed about my lack of... Oh, I'm sorry. Did I like that? We were talking about that before you started Spanish. recording. Was I? Did I blow your cover? Are you... No, 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 no. Okay. I'm including all of this in the video that I'm okay. posting. Don't worry about it. Yeah. All right. I'm going to um, go. Okay. Well, thank you so much. It was great to talk to you. Um, I hope you feel okay and good luck with your extra arm. Anything dumb I said is because I was vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Of course. Okay. Got Bye. it. Okay. Have a good night. Take care.